Hi, I'm John Schreiber. For 18 seasons, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center has been the state's premier home to world-class and community-centered performances. We pride ourselves on presenting something for everyone. That's why we're proud to partner with the Caucus Educational Corporation to produce One-on-One -on -one with Steve Adubato at NJPAC. This unique series features some of the best talent New Jersey has produced. We're pleased to welcome them and you to the Arts Center. Funding for this edition of One-on-One -on -One with Steve Adubato at NJPAC has been provided by Prudential Financial's Global Communications Department, TD Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, Cone Resnick, Accounting, Tax, and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results, the Fidelco Group, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, Turn a Dream into a Degree, and by Josh S. Weston. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the uh, New Jersey Performing Arts Center. This is one-on-one. -on -one. We're doing a series called Newark at a Crossroads, and uh, totally appropriate. We could not do this series if we were not sitting down with the mayor of Newark, Raz Baraka. We are honored to have you, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We're doing this uh, taping on the 5th of December. There's so much going on, not just in Newark, but let's talk bigger picture. Yeah. The decision, Staten Island, mm. Eric Garner, Mm -hmm. Ferguson before that. Right. You've spoken out. Do you connect the two together or do you see them separately? Well, I think they, uh, it's appropriate to put them together uh, simply because uh, the acts that took place are incredibly similar. Uh, we're talking about police uh, and policing mm -hmm. black and brown and poor communities. Uh, the relationship there being uh, frayed, if if at all broken, um, you know, people being killed uh, in situations that I think could have been different, uh, and then the outcome of those trials of uh, are the same. Well, not even a trial, uh, the, the, lack of indictment. Hearing, the lack of indictment, meaning that they didn't even want to take it to trial. And, and if there's any question about how a person is killed, about what happened, that at least deserves a trial. Like in a democratic country, that we at least have should have the opportunity to go to trial and let your, a jury decide guilt or innocence. You know, you're an elected official, you're a public policy maker, you're a, someone that people look to for direction. But as a, uh, as a person of color with a family history of having a dad who was a, uh, a leader in this community who spoke out for many years, just as a person, particularly in the Staten Island case, mm -hmm. When the Staten Island grand jury came back and opted not to indict the police officer involved in the uh, choking death, the homicide, which was declared by the medical examiner in New York, what was your personal and human reaction? Well, I was outraged. I wasn't shocked. I mean, as Trayvon Martin, then Ferguson, then this, I mean, and many more before that. Uh, by the way, you put them all together, though. Yes. You don't see I Eric see Garner as... as, as uniquely different because for many of us, it was so clearly that's, that's black and white. Well, and, and it would be different because what Eric Gardner's case did was show America what black people see all the time. So the kind of mistreatment and uh, the, the kind of arbitrary justice that takes place sometimes on these streets uh, was videotaped and so the world had an opportunity to see what we experience over and over again, black, Latinos, poor people, even in some of these neighborhoods, it's important uh, that we put it all together because we need folks to understand that this is not an anomaly, right? This is something that uh, happens quite often and too frequent. And in the it is? The travesty of justice, right? The, the death and murder and attack or of African Americans and Latinos and poor folks in these communities by, unfortunately, some law enforcement officials. And then after that, those cases uh, being 
uh, either put under the rug or nothing happens or, or the fact that our lives are, are seemingly not as valuable mm -hmm. as other people's lives in the democracy that we live in. But in Newark, where the police are such an important presence, where the police are in fact being monitored by the federal government for a whole range of reasons, most of all because a series of cases were brought saying that uh, blacks and Latinas were de being disproportionately stopped and frisked and, and their civil rights were being violated. But this disproportionate number who are being killed on the streets, black yes. and Latinos, are being killed by those who are right. black and Latino. That's right. The, as we do this program, you spoke out right after the Thanksgiving holiday about the rash of murders and violent crime and yeah. said there's a serious emergency in the city. Yes, sure. That crime, that violent crime, those murders, keeps you up at night and causes you to say, what, we, what do we need to do to deal with that? At the end of the day, we do need police, and we need policing in all of these communities. We need police in our community. Uh, we need uh, to make sure we have some sense of order, stability in families and neighborhoods, and there's a lot of ways to address that. And one of those ways is that we have to have uh, the resources to hire more police. Police need to be You trained. don't have enough in Newark? No, we, of course we need more police in the city. How many are you down? Um, a few hundred. I, won't, I don't want to say specifically what the numbers are, but we're we down a few hundred and we need, and more are retiring. Uh, and we have a plan to bring police officers on annually. We're going to bring police officers on every year uh, for the next four or five years to make on sure. On the street. On the street. To, to hire new police officers to make sure that we are covering officers who are retiring or, or who are leaving. But we need even more on top of that, uh, which means we need the revenue to, to make that happen. And we need them to be trained. The revenue. So, and we need officers to be trained. Talk, right. about, talk about the training and talk about, okay, two things. Number one, you don't have the revenue because of the fiscal situation in the city. Do you need state and or federal money to do that? Well, we, we, we have won some federal grants, so, and, and we do that to hire more officers. But, uh, yes, we are uh, trying to work feverishly to find additional sources of recurring revenue in the city. Uh, we're going to engage Port Authority. We're going to engage our state legislature, engage, engage the governor's office to help us uh, get the tools that we need to raise more revenue in the city. I mean, uh, simply because the cost of living is increasing, but the money that we have on hand is not, right? So we need mm. the money on hand to increase with the cost without uh, taxing the people out of existence that uh, live in the city, where almost three-fourths of the city is either tax exempt or abated, we need folks to be able to pay taxes. Mayor, you said, and this is an interesting issue because it goes back to police minority relations, it goes back to the issue of trust as well. You said it is important that police wear body cameras. Right. Why? Well, I think it protects police officers as well. It protects them from frivolous lawsuits. It, it monitors the situation. It also, I, I think, even in Newark, when we have our special units out, when they come up, when they pull out a camera, the camera probably works uh, even mm. better than the police. The camera doesn't just make the police officers behave in a certain way. It also makes the residents and everybody else behave in a but certain way. But we had the cameras well. in Staten Island. It showed right. what it showed, and then what happened happened. Right, but that, that so we needed the camera. And because the camera, what the camera did was mm. outline to everybody in America clearly what happened. The other part that the camera doesn't fix is the justice system. Mm. The justice system has to be fixed by human beings, by individuals. Feds need to come in here? By, by folks to, to make sure that justice is done. Feds need to come in? Come in where? To, to Newark? Feds need to come in and step in aggressively in cases like Eric Garner, in cases like Michael Brown. Feds need to come in aggressively and deal with police departments that have, history, have a history of civil rights violations, like well, Newark. Well, the feds are doing that. So right. the, the More DO, aggressively? The DOJ is... Department I think the, DOJ, the DOJ is here now as aggressive the as they role? could the be. The people who don't know that, Mayor, they go, oh, so the Department of Justice is managing the police department. That's not true. No, they're not managing it. What they do is they put a monitor in place, right? They also, we sign an MOU that mm -hmm. suggests... Memorandum mem of understanding. Of, right, to outline the specific things that they think need to happen. Police officers need to be trained. You need a review board. Right. Uh, you, you need cops to wear cameras. So they give you all of these things. And the things I just said are, are items that are actually on Newark's MOU. Right. right? So uh, this happens in many cities around the country. Uh, so I think it's a, a positive thing and should continue to, to go forward. Uh, I do think the police, uh, the federal government does need to step in in some of these cases that they believe that people's rights have been, civil rights have civil been rights. violated and begin to uh, uh, take matters into their hands. Mr. Mayor, obviously we could sit and talk about crime all day because for so many people it dominates their life. But 
as someone who has spent his professional life as an educator, as an educational administrator at Central High School, you've been a principal there, you care deeply about this as well. And, and in many ways, it's not separate. Talk about the education of the public school children in the city of Newark. Where is it now, and where do you want and need it to be? Well, we right now, because of you know what's happening in the city, there's been a lot of conflict and a lot of confusion. Well, how's there? I hadn't read. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of issues, you know, and, uh, you know... You're going to be able to get together with the superintendent and work things out, Cammy Anderson. Hey, man, I wish it would sound like, can we all just get along? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Which but, shouldn't be that difficult. <laughs> What's some, the biggest beef there? Well, the, fu fundamentally, there, there's some things that need to happen, but I think the, some of the, the biggest things is people need to have the right to be able to go to school in the neighborhoods where they live. If they want to do that, they should be able to be afforded that opportunity uh, by the mere fact that they're Americans, they live in this city, this city, they have a right to go to school in their neighborhood, right? So that, that's number one. Uh, and then we, as public servants, have to make those schools work. Our job is not to sell off our assets to everybody. Uh, our job is to make the public we sell, sector work. We sell our assets. Well, you mean the, the, the school buildings, give them away, do these kinds of things. Our job is to make these schools work. Not say this school is a failure, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. The question becomes, what have you done to improve the quality of education uh, in that school, right? And so I think that's our job to do, to make sure that these institutions actually work for the children that live in this community. And I think that there, there is a way, uh, so there's all kinds of schools in America, there always has been. We have parochial schools, you have private schools, Montessori schools, and now charter schools. You have all of these schools, but they don't threaten the public school uh, institution as it stands, right? So if, if schools want to come, they have a right to do that. You, are you okay with the idea of, of having parents be able to choose between public schools and a, non, and a non public school and give that child, give that child, that parent a voucher to go to? No. Not. I'm, I'm Bad opposed, idea? I'm opposed to vouchers unilaterally. Across the board. Across the board. A pilot program? No programs. I, I don't because, think. Because, Mr. Mayor? There's no evidence that it's worked. The places where they did it. They Milwaukee have, doesn't work. Did, never, didn't work. The, the research and the data shows that. That's not, okay. that's not the mayor's opinion. So it, it, it hasn't worked in a way. Uh, that would merit us to do something like that and defunct. So and let's just work with the public, public schools. schools. I say we do work with the public schools. And not only that, but we, if you're interested in having opportunities uh, for other schools to exist, you have a right to do that. I mean, even the early, some of the early discussions around charters were about lab schools. Charter schools. Uh, lab schools that allow them to do things, uh, and if they were successful, to spread those practices across the public domain. Right, right now, it's just, a, it's just a way that we can now take the place of public school. And we don't need to do that. We don't need to take place of public school. I think public school is a fundamental piece of our democracy, the way it is, centralized school boards, parents and community having a right mm -hmm. and a say-so on how schools are governed. All of that is important, right? And it, it has to be free and unfettered to all Americans, to new Americans, to, to, to any kind of American. We, we ought to have those institutions. Mayor, before I let you out here, a couple minutes. Um... Your dad, uh, he sat right in that chair. It may have been one of the last interviews he did um, before he um, passed. He did an extraordinary interview with us. He read um, some of his writings. Uh, he was an extraordinary writer. Um, you, you write poetry. You know, it means a lot to you. In fact, you wrote um, something called Black Girls Learn Hard Love, a collection of poems. Before I let you out here, your writing of poetry means a lot to you, doesn't it? Yeah, of course. <laughs> because? One, you know, I'm, I'm an artist. I grew up in a household full of, of, of art and, and literature and uh, music. So it's a part of my DNA. Uh, and it's a part of something that, you know, I love. So, yeah, I like to write and read at the same time. Helps you govern? Of course it does. How it keeps, so? Well, it keeps me balanced. And it, it, it also gives me a different perspective that I think that uh, you know, doesn't come necessarily with the job, right? It gives me a different kind of perspective and a different view of uh, the importance of people, of art, of music, of culture, and how to change people's attitudes, minds, their behavior. You love art. It a place is, like this is important. Right. NJ Pack is important, isn't it? NJ Pack is a beautiful place. We love Tell it here. Tell folks why who may not have been here yet. <laughs> Tell folks, they, they haven't come to NJ Pack. Tell them why they should come. Oh, NJ plug, Pack, plug. NJ Pack is beautiful. <laughs> it, is, it is probably one of the gems of the city. 
incredible programming here. Uh, I probably spend more time in NJ Pack now than I do in my own home. I mean, it is an incredible edifice, and we have rich and wonderful programming out of here. How about your town hall meetings here, right? Yeah, we had a town hall meeting Just the other here. night. Yep, and we, the next one is in February. Beautiful. Uh, you know, John Schreiber, who, who, who runs the place, is an incredible guy, and uh, he is expanding arts into the community, which is what we need desperately here in Newark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Stay right there. Appreciate it. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We welcome Carrie Jackson, jazz vocal stylist, also a uh, Man, what an entrepreneur you are. President and CEO of CJ Records and CJ Recording and Productions. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. See, we were just talking about this before we got on the air. You're not just a great musician, but you are an entrepreneur businesswoman. It helps to be a good businesswoman. Why? Well, you have the experience and, and of getting out and networking with people, and you have a marketing plan, um, and you have things that you want to do. So you have to get out in the community and hobnob and rub elbows with people. So you ever say to yourself, by the way, when did you start playing? Well, it depends on how much time you have. Um, Were you a kid? Yeah. I was about six years old in Newark, singing in Mount Calvary Baptist Church, mm. and the children's choir, the young adult choir, the gospel choir, went on the road with the uh, WWRL gospel chorus. Big influences so, were? My biggest influences, Mahalia Jackson, hmm. Sarah Vaughan, um, Nat King Cole, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Carmen McRae, Billie Holiday, Dinah Washington, mm -hmm. all of the above. And by the way, your latest CD dedicated to? Sarah Vaughan. The great Sarah Vaughan right here in Newark. But I go back to the, to the business thing. I'm fascinated by the idea of you're such a great musician, but you felt the need, you feel the need to manage your own business, to form your own label out of necessity? Uh, basically out of necessity. Uh, back in 1996, sitting down with a group of singers, um, at that time their greatest attribution would be to uh, get that major record deal. Got to get a big deal. Got to get a big deal. But I decided that at that time that I wanted to create my own record label. I wanted to be able to help other musicians and I wanted to produce records and I wanted to really help people get to where they needed to be at whatever plateau or whatever space in time they were. So in 1996, I became incorporated, and that's where CJ Recording evolved from. What made you think you could pull all the business pieces together? Well, I've kind of always been um, a businesswoman. I worked in city government for many years. I was an administrator, and I've always been kind of a hands-on uh, paper person. I've always had uh, good logistical skills, very detailed, very organized, and I had a <clears> sense of business. But it wasn't like somebody was throwing a ton of money at you. Here's $10 million to start your business. You if they had that. done that, it would have made it a whole <laughs> lot easier. I wouldn't be struggling as hard. <laughs> it, go back to that. The struggle never ends, does it? The struggle never ends. You have to always be on top of your game. Um, you have to make sure that you have your marketing skills, your branding, your promotion, your network, your fan base. And now it's great because... I'm sorry, were you talking about public television or are you talking about your <laughs> world? <laughs> same CJ thing, Records. right? Yeah. Same, same thing, right? Yeah. Um, talk about your music. Talk about the, um, the CD. By the way, you're going to be playing just a little bit. What are you going to be playing? I'm going to be doing a Steven Sondheim song. You're going to be singing? Send in the Clowns. Yes, I'm going to be singing. I have a great musician, Rodham Schwartz, with me, and he's going to be playing with me. Okay, Send in the Clowns, Steven Sondheim, what year? I believe it was 73. 1973. Um, I did a little research on it, right. and I discovered that it was a Broadway show. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Ain't the internet great? It, it's easy to, <laughs> to find things out like that. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting. Your, your background, your musical background, started in the church, as you said. Yes. Influenced by these extraordinary uh, women. Exactly. Right? Um, staying relevant, staying in the game, beyond all the business side of it, has your musical taste and style changed significantly in any way? 
I wouldn't say that it's changed significantly, particularly with jazz. Jazz is America's classical art form. And, and staying in the format of the Great American Songbook. What does that mean, by the way, the Great American Songbook? Lerner and Lowe, Ira and George Gershwin, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Basie those were standard tunes. Mm. And even though the majority of these songs came out of Broadway, jazz musicians kind of embraced it and adopted it. Um, if you're talking about uh, Western European music, um, if Mozart was alive today, he'd probably be singing it. Mm. But when you take the music and you're looking at it in the format of a tune, jazz musicians do what we call improvisation. So we can take a song and we can bend it, we can twist it, um, we can come on the beat, we can go off the beat, but basically you're taking a song and you're personalizing it. So you're taking a song um, that means a lot to you and you're trying to portray that to your audience. People still love the old standards. You know, the songs of Doris Day, the songs of Ginger Rogers. How about Sinatra for me? I love Sinatra. Do you put him in that category? I wouldn't put him in a jazz category. You would not? Not necessarily. Okay. But he also had a way of... He um, made it his own. He made it his own. He did it his way. Uh, yeah. So let me ask you this. So as you do send in the clowns, what does it mean to you? Well, listening to the song, it's a song about heartbreak. It's a song about a lost love. It's very meaningful. It's very deep. A singer is a storyteller. So if you're singing a song, if it doesn't mean anything to you, it ain't going to mean nothing to nobody else. Wow. So you take a song and you, you make it your own. I listen to the melody. I listen to the lyrics. And there's something about that song that, that just pulls at my heartstrings. And a lot of times, people will come up to me, do you do this song? Do you do that song? Or someone could say, something about that song that really touched me. And when people love a song, it makes you feel good mm -hmm. when they hear something and they love what you're doing. Well, Carrie Jackson, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to go to that piano. Okay. It's very rare that uh, we allow someone, we have someone, we're honored by someone who actually is going to end the the show, uh, so you're going to end it for us. You're I thank go, you so uh, much. Well, we're at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. What better place than to have a great performer, a great singer, thank and the show "Sending the Clowns." Carrie uh, Jackson, the nearness of you, Carrie Jackson. If I had my way, Carrie Jackson, a tribute to the great Sarah, Sarah Vaughan, Newark's own. Born and um, raised right here in Newark, New Jersey. You honor us, Carrie Jackson. Thank you so much. Listen forward, looking forward to hearing you. You're going to love this. Just when I stopped opening doors, finally knowing the one that I wanted was yours, making my entrance again with my greatest of ease, sure of my lines, but no one is there. Don't you love farce? My 
I fall, I fear I thought that you'd want what I want Sorry, my dear Where are the clowns? Send in the clowns Don't bother the heat One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and by the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, in cooperation with NJTV, and 13 for WNET. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been provided by Prudential Financial's Global Communications Department, TD Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, Cone Resnick, the Fidelco Group, NJ Best, and by Josh S. Weston. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey, and by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. When you work in a public school, you're a part of the community. So when Superstorm Sandy hit, the school employees jumped right in to help. The middle school here served as a refuge for people who were forced from their homes. We all pitched in to help. Custodians, cafeteria workers, teacher aides, mechanics, groundskeepers, all pitching in to help out. School employees are part of a team, whether it's to help educate our children or to recover from a terrible tragedy. That's why I'm so proud to be a member of the NJEA.